Good morning. Welcome to today's presentation, Back Pressure Regulators Made Simple. I'm your host, Jeff Hopkins, and I'm joined today by Eric Kayla of Swagelock Company. Eric joined Swagelock 20 years ago with a university degree in mechanical engineering and started with Swagelock as a lab engineer, working on high purity fittings and pipe fittings. He since worked in new product development and assembly engineering. And today, Eric is based in San Diego as a field engineer, where he spends at least half his work life on the road throughout the Western US, Canada, and Mexico, meeting with customers and discussing solutions to their needs. So let's hand the mic over to Eric now so he can walk us through his presentation, Back Pressure Regulators Made Simple. Eric? Thanks, Jeff. Good morning, everybody. Today, we're going to talk about back pressure regulators. And we're going to start with a review of pressure regulators, talking about sensing elements, hard seat versus soft seat designs, different loading mechanisms. Along the way, we'll hit a couple of terms that are important for back pressure regulators. We'll discuss back pressure regulator theory of operation specifically the balance of forces. We'll talk about back pressure regulators versus relief valves. We'll cover back pressure regulator flow curves. And throughout the presentation, we'll have a few common applications for back pressure regulators. There are two types of pressure regulators. The first type is a pressure reducing regulator, which controls pressure to the process sensing on the outlet of the regulator. A back pressure regulator controls pressure upstream of the regulator by sensing on the inlet side of the regulator. That is to say that a pressure reducing regulator controls a high inlet pressure to a set downstream pressure, and a back pressure regulator controls upstream pressure by staying closed to raise the pressure and then opening to allow excess pressure to move downstream. The pressure reducing regulator as we just said, its role is to take a high inlet pressure, reduce that inlet pressure to a set outlet pressure, and keep that outlet pressure as constant as possible, regardless of variations to inlet pressure or flow. The balance of forces for a pressure reducing regulator, you have your loading force above your sensing element, you have the inlet spring force, the outlet pressure force, and the inlet pressure force all balancing below the sensing element. So our balance of force equation is F1, our loading force, equal to the sum of our internal forces, F2 plus F3 plus F4. For a back pressure regulator, the function is to keep a set inlet pressure. And that means the regulator will either open in the case of excess upstream pressure or close when the upstream pressure drops below the desired set point and allow that upstream pressure to build back to the set point where the regulator will begin uh, opening again. And this is accomplished by our fluid force inside the regulator, F on the graph, being slightly, to, slightly lower than our loading force, F sub S, causing the pocket to close. Now, as we look inside of a back pressure regulator, a lot of the components look very similar to the pressure reducing regulators. We've got our in this case, loading springs, we've got piston designs versus diaphragm sensing designs. We've got hard seats, soft seats. We've got um, back pressure regulator designs with poppets and without poppets. So a lot of similarities with pressure reducing regulators. Now looking at a balance of forces for the back pressure regulator, the first is looking at a no poppet design. And as we can see, this regulator just has the seat with an O-ring on it, sealing against the diaphragm, but no poppet in the seat. So our uh, balance of forces equation, we have our loading force, F1, above the sensing element. We have our inlet pressure force and our outlet pressure force below the sensing element. So our balance of forces is going to be our loading force, F1, greater than F3 plus F4 to keep the back pressure regulator closed. As soon as the inlet pressure force and the outlet pressure force rise above our set point, the regulator will begin oscillating to hold that upstream pressure constant. <clears throat> Comparing the pressure reducing regulator versus the back pressure regulator in a cutaway, this slide really illustrates the poppet design for the pressure reducing regulator 
versus the no poppet designed for the back pressure regulator. So you can see that the back pressure regulator has no poppet, but it does have an O-ring in the seat that allows the sensing element to seal right on the seat. There is also a back pressure regulator with a poppet, and that's the design we're looking at here. The balance of forces for this design is going to be similar. We're going to have our loading force above our sensing element plus the additional force from our poppet spring. And below the sensing element, we have our inlet pressure force and our outlet pressure force. So our balance of force equation is going to be F1 plus F2 being greater than F3 plus F4 to keep the regulator shut. As soon as our uh, forces balance out or F3 plus F4 are higher than F1 plus F2, the regulator is going to open and begin oscillating to hold that upstream pressure constant. Comparing the pressure reducing regulator versus the back pressure regulator with a poppet, you can see that in a pressure reducing regulator, the poppet is below the seat. And in a back pressure regulator, the poppet is above the seat. So although they are both using a poppet and seat design, the back pressure regulator design is inverted from the pressure reducing regulator. And we see our poppet strokes up into the seat on the pressure reducing regulator. And in the back pressure regulator, the poppet strokes down to the seat. Some terms to be aware of. We've talked about droop in previous webinars. And droop is a decrease in outlet pressure caused by an increase in flow rate in a pressure reducing regulator. Accumulation, on the other hand, is the increase in inlet pressure required to obtain a specified flow rate for a back pressure regulator. As we look at droop on a flow curve, we can see that as flow increases from left to right in our graph, our flow curves drop off. This is an illustration of droop. For a back pressure regulator, we can see that the curve rises from left to right. And this is an illustration of accumulation. As our flow increases, we tend to build pressure on the inlet side of the regulator. Now, it is possible to use both a pressure reducing regulator and a back pressure regulator in the same system. The key is that there has to be some sort of restriction between the two regulators. So in the example shown here, we have a pressure reducing regulator into a system, and that system uses two needle valves, some flow indicators, and an analyzer before feeding to a back pressure regulator. So the intention is that the pressure reducing regulator is going to drop the inlet pressure into the system to a set point, and that back pressure regulator is going to hold the pressure across the analyzer at a specific pressure before it begins to open and allow excess pressure to go downstream. There are two types of sensing elements for back pressure regulators, very similar to the sensing elements for pressure reducing regulators. We have a diaphragm sensing design and a piston sensing design. The diaphragm sensing design is going to have greater sensitivity. It's, good. it's more flexible. It's going to react quicker to smaller changes in pressure. And we have a wide variety of, of materials to pick from for that diaphragm. The piston sensing design is more robust. It's stronger. It's going to be for higher pressure applications. But it is going to be less sensitive. So any small, many changes in pressure in the system might not cause that piston to react where they might cause a diaphragm to react. There are also two types of seat designs to consider in back pressure regulators. The first is a soft seat design, which is an O-ring sealing on, in this case, sealing on the diaphragm or the sensing element. And the second is a hard seat design. The back pressure regulator with the soft seat design is specific for some of the smaller instrumentation style back pressure regulators. We've looked at this before in a couple of other cutaways, but we have that elastomer O-ring on the top of the seat, and the sensing element, or the diaphragm, comes down and, and seals on that O-ring on the seat. So that's the soft seat design. The hard seat design is specific to the poppet regulators, or the back pressure regulators with the poppet design. In this case, it is typically a, a PCTFE or peak material that is in the seat, and then the poppet would seal against that PCTFE or peak. The poppet's going to be a machined stainless steel or other metallic sealing against that hard plastic seat. The next topic to cover is going to be loading mechanisms. 
and there's three main types of loading mechanisms to consider. The first is a spring-loaded regulator. The second is a dome-loaded regulator. And the third is a combination spring and dome load regulator, also called a differential pressure regulator or a bias regulator. For the spring-loaded design, our loading force is created by compressing a spring above the sensing element. So we compress the spring a specific amount that generates a load on the sensing element. And as long as our loading force, F sub S, is greater than our internal force is F, the poppet is going to stay in the seat and the regulator is going to remain closed. Once our loading force is less than our internal forces, the poppet is going to rise, allowing pressure to come across the seat of the regulator. For dome-loaded regulators, we replace that spring force by pressurizing the cavity above the sensing element. So in this case, a gas or a liquid is fed into the dome chamber at a pressure equal to or slightly above the required outlet pressure. And we typically expect about a one-to-one -one relationship between the dome pressure and the outlet pressure of the regulator. As long as our dome pressure is greater than our internal forces F, it's going to keep the poppet in the seat. Once the internal forces are greater than the dome force, then our poppet is going to pop up and allow that excess pressure to cross the seat of the regulator. A combination spring and dome loaded regulator, or the differential pressure or bias regulator, uses both a spring load and a dome pressure load to generate your loading force. And typically, this, these types of regulators are designed to work by having the spring force plus the pressure force generating your loading force. But there is a negative bias as well that we'll talk about in just a second. So a positive bias, or just a standard differential pressure regulator, as we can see here, we've got a loading spring and a dome loading chamber. So the control pressure, or the outlet pressure of this regulator, is going to be a combination of our spring force, F sub S, plus our dome pressure force, F sub D. So if we think about F sub F1 in our force balance equation, F1 is going to be equal to F sub S, the spring force, plus F sub D, the dome pressure force. An example of this might be where we have a water oil gas separator, and we need to hold that gas to a high pressure to be able to re-inject it into the constant outlet line. So in this case, we've got water and oil coming out of the separator on the bottom two connections, gas coming out of the separator on top, but we need to be able to have that gas reach the pressure in the outlet or vent line before it can be re-injected into the line. So we'd hold this, this back pressure regulator, we would set the bias on the spring to maybe 10 or 15 PSI higher than the pressure in the outlet line, allowing that gas to be re-injected into the outlet. Now, occasionally, we may want to set a back pressure lower than our reference pressure. So for a system that has a vent at a set pressure, or has to vent at a set pressure lower than a reference pressure, we somehow have to decrease the pressure created by the reference pressure in the dome. In this case, we use the spring to push from below the sensing mechanism, decreasing the influence of the dome, or the reference pressure, by the am amount of the set spring. So in the case shown here, we've got a, a negative bias regulator or a, a negative differential pressure regulator. We can see that we have our dome loading chamber above our sensing element, but our load spring is below the sensing element. In this case, our control pressure, the pressure that this regulator is going to be set to, which holding the upstream pressure to the control pressure, will be our dome pressure force, F sub D, minus our spring force, F sub S. So there's that negative bias subtracting the spring force from the dome pressure force. Let's talk a minute about back pressure regulator flow curves. We already talked about accumulation a little bit earlier, but as we look at the flow curves, this is, should be the primary way we want to size a back pressure regulator. First, we need to pick out our control range. So this is the, the pressure that we want the regulator to be able to control to. We want to select the inlet pressure of the regulator. And finally, we need to figure out what the flow range of the regulator is going to be. 
Once we know those three data points, then we can find the proper flow curve to fit the regulator to the application. A common question is, how does a back pressure regulator differ from a relief valve? In the cutaway shown here, we see a relief valve, and we see a lot of similar components in the relief valve that we would see in a back pressure regulator. We've got a poppet, we've got a loading spring, have a seat. Seems very, very similar. But if we take a close look, our poppet and seat also acts as our sensing mechanism. So we don't have the sensitivity in a relief valve that we have in a back pressure regulator. So you can look at back pressure regulators and relief valves as being similar but different. A back pressure regulator is designed to control pressure. It's designed to control that upstream pressure to a set point. It is a precision device designed to have a precise opening and closing to control that pressure. And it's designed to act as a dynamic device, always in motion, opening and closing to control the upstream pressure. A relief valve is designed specifically for overpressure protection. It's designed to have bulk release of pressure, so it's got imprecise closing after opening. So you have a, basically a wide resealing band. So after it does open, you're going to have significant pressure drop before it closes again. And relief valves are designed as static devices. They're designed to maintain, to stay closed the majority of their life and only open in instances of overpressure. So they're designed primarily to stay closed, but occasionally to open. An application for a pressure relief valve is shown here. This is a, a CNG compress compressor, and there's a relief valve after each stage of the compressor set at staggered pressure settings so that at each stage, if you do have an overpressure situation, the relief valve is going to open, allowing that excess pressure from that stage to vent downstream. Questions? Yes, uh, there there were a few that came in, Eric. Uh, let me uh, and if you have any, please, of course, put your question into the chat box. Here's the first one. Why would you choose a regulator with a spring and dome instead of just a spring or just a dome? Good question. And let's jump back to that slide. But Okay, so here we've got that combination spring and dome load, the differential pressure regulator. And this is a case you would want to use the positive bias regulator if you have to control the, the upstream pressure before the regulator equal to a dome pressure plus some spring force. So in this, in, a, in the example we showed here, As our media goes into our separator, you're going to have the water and oil and gas all separate out. As the gas separates out, it's going to drop in, in pressure. It's not going to come, it's not going to stay at the same pressure that it comes in at because you've got some vapor space that the, the gas can go up and pressure or, uh, reduce volume to drop pressure. So to be able to re-inject that gas into the, a constant out, constant pressure outlet, in this case you have a constant pressure 110 psi outlet, we'd have to make sure that gas is at least 110 psi, if not higher, to to flow into the outlet stream that has the water and oil at 110 psi. So in this case, we take a reference from the water or oil line back to our dome of our differential pressure regulator, and then set the bias on our spring to 10 or 15 psi. So the gas is a little higher pressure than the constant outlet line, allowing it to re-inject into the, the combined oil and gas line downstream. All right, we got a, we got a second question, Eric. Uh, for lower pressure, uh, specifically less than 15 psi, is the dome or spring better when controlling only back pressure? Uh, another good question, and I'm going to jump back up to the the different designs. Both both the designs, the spring and dome load, are going to do well in controlling to a specific pressure. 
The big difference with the spring loader design versus the dome loader design is going to be in the flow curve. So as we jump and look at our flow curve, and where we are going to be concerned is in the accumulation. The accumulation is going to be more for a spring loaded regulator than for the dome loaded regulator. So if, if it's important to have precise pressure control, for example, if you need to hold 15 psi with very little variability and plus or minus across a pretty broad flow band, a dome loaded regulator is going to be a better option. If you've got more flexibility in the tolerance of that set point of that 15 psi, or if you have a fairly narrow flow requirement, then a spring loaded, spring -loaded regulator would work just fine. Great, we got we got another one. Uh, what is the most common failure in back pressure regulators? Another good question. And let me jump further back. Both pressure reducing and back pressure regulators. The most common failure mode is going to be in the seat area. So as we look at our two types of seats here, we've got our soft seat and our hard seat design. Um, you've got a in the hard seat design, you've got a metallic poppet and a plastic seat. Any sort of contaminant or particulate in the system that gets caught in the seat is going to interrupt the seal between the, the poppet and the seat. Once you have contamination in this region, it's going to cause the regulator not to seal when it goes to close. So it's not going to hold the back pressure quite as accurately upstream. This leads us to say that filtration before regulators, good filtration before regulators is very important. This will help prevent any damage to the seat ceiling area and extend the life of the regulator. Great, looks like we got, we got one more. Um, it is, uh, the question is, if the design is similar, why is a relief valve imprecise as compared to a back pressure regulator? Another good one. It all goes down to the sensing mechanism. So looking here on the screen at the, the diaphragm versus piston sensing designs for the, the regulator, in the diaphragm sensing design, you've got the full area of the diaphragm that is sensing on the pressure. In the piston sensing design, you've got the full area of the piston sensing on the pressure. For the relief valve design, I'm jumping way forward here to get to the relief valve, the only area that you have sensing on the pressure is the poppet. And it really is the area of the poppet that is inside of the seat. So it's a very, very small area. So your sensing in a relief valve is, is very crude compared to a relief valve. All right, I think we got time for one more, uh, if you're up for it, Eric. Sure. Okay. Uh, which which type of regulator is better for high pressures, specifically 3,000 PSI or, or even higher? Uh, for a high-pressure system, using a pressure-reducing regulator or a back-pressure regulator is really going to depend on where you need that precise pressure control. If you have a high pressure supply, um, let's imagine that you've got uh, 4,500 PSI into this 3,000 PSI system. You would need to use a pressure reducing regulator to cut the pressure into the system. However, if you have a fairly stable 3,000 PSI supply into your system, but you have a number of valves and instruments between your supply and outlet, and you're going to get a pressure drop across that system, so having a back pressure regulator on the outlet of the system would allow you to build pressure in the system, holding it 3,000 PSI across the system before the back pressure regulator goes into dynamic operation, allowing the excess pressure to pass downstream, but still holding and maintaining that 3,000 PSI upstream. Thank you, Eric. And thanks to each of you on the line. We will now close this technical briefing. Goodbye. <laughs>